we're going to talk about logging and how to do secure logging in a system. So we'll start about uh, start with some general uh, general pointers about how to do secure logging, and then we'll look at a specific example, Schneier Kelsey logs, which uh, provides a mechanism for doing logging in an untrusted environment. So basically, secure logging, uh, the trivial solution would be to have a process write log messages to a file. However, this means that the running process must access the file and uh, the running process might be able to do whatever it likes with the file and the user might be able to access the file as well. So one solution to uh, do logging internally uh, would be to use append-only access and thus uh, no reading and rewriting is allowed uh, for the log. And in most operating systems, this could, can be implemented such that the user simply cannot access the logs, but uh, certain programs like system programs uh, can write to the log but not read from the log. And then there is a specific system program that can read from the log and only the uh, systems administrator can access that one. And uh, this, of course, only works if the user is limited in what it can do within the system. So, for instance, if the user has access to the hardware, then the user can simply uh, extract the hard drive from the hardware and read it in another computer system and thus read the logs. And then it can also modify the logs and basically do whatever it likes. So, how do we know if the user has managed to modify the logs or not. Now, this is a difficult question because we only have the logs to, to use uh, for this. Uh, and if the user can modify that, then how are we supposed to see it? And it turns out that there are some uh, ways to actually achieve this to detect if a user has modified the logs and we will return to that in a bit when we talk about the Schneier Kelsey logs. Uh, but for now we're going to look at another option and that's to do logging to some external device instead. So we could simply transfer the log messages to another system uh, when they happen. So uh, the system never writes the logs to its own uh, file storage, but rather it simply sends the message immediately to a dedicated log server or something like that, which uh, in turn writes the, the log messages to file and stores them. Now, this would allow us to, uh, to let the, the user uh, do whatever in the system and have access to the hardware as well because uh, then we know that uh, the logs are stored safely somewhere else where the user can't access them. Uh, however, the, the problem remains that the systems administrator uh, has super user access to this uh, external system so there is some entity that can modify these logs but at least the, the user uh, cannot. Uh, even if the user managed to uh, turn off the logs, that action will probably be logged uh, before it happens. So we can actually read from the logs and see that the user turned the logging mechanisms off. Uh, so it's detectable. But the systems administrator is uh, still a problem, but it's a problem that we can solve. Now, we can solve this by using uh, separation of duties. So uh, if we use a clever setup of separation of duties, this would work. So say that we have three systems administrators, A, B, and C, and then we simply do it like this, that the logs of uh, the, the system that uh, system administrator A uh, manages 
those are stored with systems administrators B and C. And uh, this way A can do everything in the system, even disable the logs, but then the logs uh, will be stored with B and C, so it's detectable that A has disabled the logs. So A cannot access the, the logs and, and modify them uh, afterwards, because then uh, A must collude with both B and C, which is uh, harder than uh, simply A uh, being able to, to being malicious, in, as it was in the previous case. Uh, the downside of this is, of course, that all systems must be online for this to work. So uh, the, the system that uh, A manages must uh, be able to log to B and C uh, at the same time. So the systems of B and C must also be online at all times. Now, uh, there is one way to solve this pr logging problem uh, for an offline system which is untrusted. So uh, running this logging mechanism on a system which the user has access to, even if the user has access to the hardware. And we will detect, we will be able to detect if the user has modified the logs in any way. Uh, and the, the user won't be able to read these logs and the the tools that we use for this is cryptography so um, the idea is that we have this untrusted machine and it's expected to work correctly uh, so without any compromise until some time t here so some point in time which we call t uh, and at that point, the user of the system or an attacker in some way has compromised the system. So if we number the logs, uh, so then log message number one, all the way up to log message uh, T minus one, uh, they are provided with confidentiality and integrity. So this is the idea of the system. And of course, all, uh, subsequent logs, so log, log message T and log message T plus one and so on, uh, they are under the influence of the attacker since he has gained control of the system. But uh, the adversary cannot uh, modify the logs to, to hide himself. Uh, he can delete the log messages, but uh, if we enter the system, we will see that uh, messages have been deleted. So we will detect that the adversary has been there. Uh, we can't see what he has done, but uh, at least we can detect that he was there. So the way that this works is that it uses a clever setup of uh, encryption keys and one-way functions. Uh, so the core thing is the authentication key, uh, A here, which is uh, initialized uh, by a trusted party and put into the, put into this system, so by uh, some trusted party needs to do this. And then this uh, authentication key is uh, renewed uh, for every log message that is written. And the way it's renewed is that it's uh, put through a hash function to generate a new key. And then the old key is deleted. And we know from the property of this one-way function that it's impossible to go from uh, the image to the pre-image. So if we have AJ plus one, we cannot find AJ easily. So that's what prevents the adversary from going back in time, thanks to this authentication key. Uh, so what do we actually do with the log messages then? How do we tie those to this encryption key? So say that we have uh, a log message, uh, this line up here, already in the log. And we want to add uh, another one, so uh, this line down here. 
then what we do is that we take the uh, type of the entry, so we can have several uh, types, for instance, error messages, warnings, or uh, information, information messages, and stuff like that. And then we have the data here, D, which is uh, encrypted under a key KJ here. And uh, then we have two uh, values for, uh, for authentication purposes to see, to detect any modification. Now, let's see, what do we do here? So we take this uh, message type here and we use that to compute the encryption key. So we take the message type and the authentication key that we currently have in memory, and we run those two through a hash function, and we will get an encryption key, KJ, here. Uh, and remember that it's impossible to go from K only having KJ here to find uh, either of these two or both. Uh, so this encryption key is what is used for the uh, encryption algorithm here. So we take the message data and encrypt it and uh, store it. So now we have worked out the, the first two cells here. So now to the authentication. Now what we do is that we take the ciphertext here and we tie the ciphertext to the previous line. So that's how we can detect uh, if the adversary has inserted lines or deleted lines because then uh, this will not uh, work correctly. So uh, what we do is we take the previous Y here, we put that in as input to a hash function, and then we put the uh, message, uh, the ciphertext, and the, the type of uh, log message. And we all run those uh, through a hash function and we get a value uh, y here, yj. So this is the new uh, value here. So you see that the value here depends directly on the previous value and the data uh, of this very line. So this ties these lines together so that you can't insert anything in between because then these computations are very unlikely to match. It's uh, close to impossible to find a match if you try. Yeah. So, but uh, this is, uh, so far, it's only a hash function. So, so anyone can simply redo this computation with other values and that would work. So that's why we have the last value here, which is a message authentication code for Y. So this means that we, we simply take Y, put it through a message authentication uh, algorithm to generate a message authentication code. And here we use the authentication key AJ as a key. And what we want to provide authentication for is the Y here, where the, the value which ties these lines together. And uh, once we've done that, so we've computed ZJ here, we delete, uh, we, we put aj through the hash function to get aj plus one, and then we delete aj, which means that this line can no longer be modified uh, because aj is gone, so we cannot uh, co use compute the encryption key, and we cannot compute uh, the message authentication code here either. Uh, so now this, uh, this line is, is secure because the adversary cannot find the key, so he cannot uh, modify uh, this line. Uh, now we remember uh, the reason he cannot modify this is due to the properties of the message authentication code here. So we remember uh, from the crypto session that uh, it's impossible for an adversary who doesn't know the key to, to find a message authentication code which works with a particular key and a particular input. Uh, so that's why uh, this system is secure. Now, uh, thanks to how this uh, system is constructed, uh, specifically how the encryption key is constructed, it's uh, possible to delegate to 
third party how uh, to, to verify these logs. And you do this by simply computing the decryption keys uh, for each entries. And uh, since the encryption key depends on the type of entry, you can delegate to one party to verify uh, information messages and another party to delegate uh, to verify uh, error messages, for instance, uh, because the encryption keys uh, for a line will depend on the type. So if you give one party encryption keys corresponding to error messages for each of these lines, uh, the uh, they can only decrypt those where the the type actually matches, and the other type the other lines will be total garbage. Uh, so, uh, so that's some interesting properties of uh, this particular scheme. That was everything for this time. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>